As if any of you are surprised I'm making this video, Dragged Into Sunlight is an extreme metal band that formed back in 2006 from the United Kingdom. And they are, what I'd argue, the most pulverizing extreme metal act to have formed in the 21st century. While they're not the most active on social media, with tours and festival appearances being very rare, every band photo they're wearing balaclavas to conceal their identities, and their discography is anything but prolific as it only has like half a dozen releases under their belt thus far, what they've managed to accomplish is they've left a really devastating impression within the extreme metal fan base that throughout the years in the underground scene, people continuously still talk very highly of them. Their debut release came out in February of 2009, that being this demo collaboration called Terminal Aggressor. They collaborated with this individual called Cass Mana, and I couldn't find any other information about this individual other than that they were part of this collab and that's it. And going off of just some, you know, assumption right here, I'm pretty sure Cass Mana does all of the dark ambient noise and drone sections within this demo that runs for roughly a little over 19 minutes long. Well, Dragon to Sunlight has all the extreme metal portions scattered throughout it. And one other thing I just want to correct here is that it says online that it's limited to 100 tapes. Yet when I got this um, copy uh, through their merch table when I saw them at the Maryland Death Fest, it showcases that it's number 17 out of 200. So they might have actually done a reissue for this with an additional 200 tapes. As for the music that you'll hear within Terminal Aggressor, it's one long 19 minute track. A majority of the sounds and influence you'll hear within it is dark ambience and noise that's meant to give off a very unsettling and unnerving atmosphere that they also utilize it to give off build up to the extreme metal portions within it. The extreme metal portions to be heard within this demo aren't the death metal and black metal influences you're used to hearing with Dragon to Sunlight. This is more focused on doom metal, with just this very abrasive, sludgy, slow burn take within the style that's really meant to just like drag you through the mud of just this harsh, vile atmosphere. It may not be the fan favorite release, but it's definitely something worth checking out, especially if you're a fan of extreme metal executed in a very abrasive manner. Of course, this now leads within the fan favorite release within the Dragged Into Sunlight discography, because in the same year of 2009, in September, they released their debut full length album, Hatred for Mankind. This is an album that I've talked about multiple times here on my channel. I've stated that it's one of my favorite albums within music, it's my personal favorite death metal album, and it's one of the darkest and grittiest extreme metal albums I've ever heard. And while I can go on this marathon to the moon and back, giving it all these compliments and praise that I think it rightfully deserves and stating that it's this perfect 10 out of 10 album, there's a lot of other components about it that I find really interesting that I've never really talked about before. As I stated earlier, I consider this the darkest and grittiest extreme metal album ever. And while I'm very aware that that's a bold statement on my behalf, the reason why I stand so strongly about it is because when you look at extreme metal as a whole, from its early beginnings to present day, a majority of the themes and topics you'll find are mainly fictional. For example, you have bands out there like Morbid Angel, where it's all about Satanism and demons running rampant throughout the world. Then you have other bands like Cannibal Corpse, that's very grotesque, violent, and gory with its lyrical themes and imagery that you'll see. While that all might be eyebrow raising at first, again, it's all done in a fictional way. Yet, with Dragon to Sunlight, they blend like realism with their overall approach within extreme metal, which just makes it almost become surreal now. And because of that, it just makes it all the more dark, gritty, and unsettling. One method that they like to use to help convey that approach is they use audio samples of serial killers, which has be kind of become something of like a staple that you'll come to expect within any Dragged Into Sunlight release, 
Yet with hatred for mankind, it's used numerous times from 10 different serial killers, that being Charles Manson, Kenneth Bianchi, Edmund Kemper, Maury Travis, Jeffrey Dahmer, Leonard Lake, Eileen Mornis, Joel Refkin, Richard Kalinske, and Gerard Schaefer. I want to take a minute to thank and give a shout out to Grox222. He has a YouTube video where he compiled all the audio samples that were used on Hatred for Mankind into a single video. So I'll have a link in the description to where you can check that video out. It's common knowledge that audio samples within music is nothing innovative, new, or groundbreaking. But I feel like what Dragged Into Sunlight uses them for within Hatred for Mankind is again to give off this very surrealistic approach. Because while the music is just very over the top and frantic and aggressive with the riffs and thunderous blast beats and vocals that are just very inhumane how they're performed, the audio samples give off the realistic approach now about all these you know serial killers that have done all these heinous things that the music just kind of represents it now in a sense. It just mirrors it. And because of that, you kind of feel like you're in this very fucked up world at times. But it's our fucked up world, and that's where really the surrealistic approach that Dragon to Sunlight does what Hatred for Mankind shines through. As for the relationship with Dragged Into Sunlight and their debut album, Hatred for Mankind, I feel like they're aware that this is the fan favorite album. One noticeable notion is the fact that this album goes for nearly half a thousand dollars on Discogs, the vinyl pressings for it. But there's also the notion that every live performance they've done, from all the videos you can find online to the handful of people that have seen them live, is that they'll only play material off of this album. And one of the reasons could probably be because out of all the material, everything off of Hatred for Mankind kind of comes off like the most concert friendly as it's just always this rush of just aggression and anger being played. As for their live performances, it's always been done in the same exact way with their stage antics. While later on they've always had like maybe strobe lights or a smoke machine included or maybe a giant candle set in the middle of them, the one thing they've always kept consistent that you can find throughout any YouTube video online is that they always have their backs turned to the audience. I always thought there was like a subliminal message attached with it, but it actually was confirmed by the vocalist in an interview he did in 2017 for Distorted Sound Mag that when they talked about their overall stage attire as to why they turned their backs to the audience, it all started because when they started with doing house shows when they originally formed, they didn't want to make Dragged Into Sunlight like a primary thing within their lives considering their main jobs and their main life ambitions, that Dragged Into Sunlight was just a side piece. So they wanted to mainly conceal their identities and be more anonymous to the audience. But as the band built up a little bit more steam and they wanted to progress on making music, so do they progress on with their stage attire with again adding in the strobe lights, the smoke machine, and candle set. With all the animosity that they give themselves, it might backfire on them as just the fan base will want to know more about them. And this was brought up in an interview done by Thumped where they asked that question to the band. And they answered by basically stating that nothing's really secret anymore in this world. That everyone wants to just basically know everything about everyone that they want to know about. And with the internet easily disposable and all this information easily accessible, it's kind of just become like human nature at this point to just dive into stuff that you enjoy and just know all the little details about it. And with Dragged Into Sunlight, it's no different within the fan base. I mean, there's even a meme page called I Make Memes While Listening to Dragged Into Sunlight. And they made an iceberg chart, and within it, there's one portion where it talks about, like, uh, one of the members is um, a lawyer or something like that. And while I can't confirm or deny that information, because I don't know myself, 
again, it just seems like for fans, we just want to know more about what we're into, and this is just second nature. So, while it may seem useless to other people, for a fan base, it's just human nature, I feel like. And yeah, in a way, driving to sunlight, being with all this animosity, you just want to know about them, considering that their music is just so well done. Personally, for me, one thing I always wondered about this band is their band name. Dragged Into Sunlight. Because at face value, when I was getting into them, I just figured, alright, you're just dragging bodies into sunlight. But then I thought, why would you want to do that, especially since this is all about, like, you know, serial killers and death and shit like that. It doesn't make sense. So then I thought, alright, maybe these are people finding those bodies and they drag them into sunlight. But again, that just, it doesn't make sense. It just seems so random. But I think what it actually implies is dragged into sunlight. How we're kind of like born into this world. That no matter how you come into this world, you're dragged by something to get out of the uterus into sunlight. And I think that's actually what the name implies. I know this kind of comes off like useless information, but it's just something I personally have always questioned about the name. Because, I mean, the album artwork kind of speaks for itself with hatred for mankind. When it comes to what is considered the rarest thing within the Drag Into Sunlight catalog if you're hunting physical media, a lot of people would point to that hatred for mankind on vinyl is the rarest, as it's long gone sold out out of print. It's only limited, I believe, 600 copies in total, 300 are on black, and another 300 are on white. And even for me, this was a pain in the ass to find. However, what I'd argue is the rarest piece to collect within the physical media aspect within Dragon to Sunlight is a 2011 release they did on CD of a show they performed in Amsterdam back in 2010. It's limited to 50 copies, it's hand numbered, and I've never ever once seen just a picture of it online. Apparently they do exist as it is a part of their discography, but for me personally, how I view it, this is easily the hardest thing to get within the Dragon to Sunlight discography. After the release of Hatred for Mankind in 2019, it would only be three years until we would hear a follow-up by them, that being their sophomore full-length album, Widowmaker. This album is quite different from Hatred for Mankind, as, again, in an interview they did for Thumped, they talked about the direction they would go in for Widowmaker, and the vocalist talks about the fact that while Hatred for Mankind wanted to be this very dark and super aggressive album, they wanted to make Widowmaker a lot more heavy. And because of that, they did it in all different directions as they had a discussion within the band of what they consider to be heavy. One band talks about that they think Mogwai is heavy. Another says that Chelsea Wolfe is very heavy. So there's a lot of different directions they take this album in. And it's showcased, especially within the first track on this album, there's only three tracks, so it's more like parts all like compiled within like 15 minutes each but part one of this album is very different from anything else you'll hear within the dragon to sunlight discography because it's just like this droney melody that plays on for 15 minutes that is just build up and it kind of leads into this violin section towards the end portion of it it's just very dark droney and dreary sounding throughout that yeah it bleeds into the second track is where you get like the death doom approach with then driving to sunlight that you're used to hearing but this just goes in a lot of different directions and for me personally how i look at it while i vastly prefer hatred for mankind Widowmaker is definitely their more ambitious of the two full-length albums. Another interesting feature about this album that the band had to undergo is that now the band members are very widespread apart in terms of living conditions, living nearly 300 miles apart within the UK, that communication is kind of like key at this point as to how this band's even working and continuing on. But it's also a reason as to why everything past Widowmaker, 
there's these big time gaps in terms of releases within the discography because it takes now a long time for the band to write material considering that you need to communicate with all these different members they have to agree on a certain direction some may disagree on each other and it just kind of like goes back and forth with ideas that I'm pretty sure they stated within interviews that it takes like almost a year for them just to write down one song just because of this long duration. Add to the fact too with all their personal lives and their full-time jobs that they have within their um, you know daily routine. Again, it's not like a main concern for them so it's just become more difficult for them to continue on this project. I bring this up because with their follow-up collaboration album called Envy, Envy standing for negative volume, where they collaborated with Nother Tongues, it stated that they had the ideas and were working on this album back in 2011, yet it wouldn't be released until 2015. Musically, Envy reminds me a lot of Hatred for Mankind, as the black metal and death metal influences are showcasing up more often on this album with doom metal and sludge metal kind of showcasing as well. But it's just a bit more experimental, especially since there's a lot more electronic and industrial usage on this album. That it's just basically hatred for mankind, but just more experimental and kind of drifts off with some droney noises at times. Thanks to all the inclusion of that with Maurice from Nother Tongues. Which I remember again, when I first saw the uh, hype video for this, I thought it was a joke. Like, two of the most nightmarish, hateful, and fucked up musical projects you can find within extreme music working together on an album. It's literally a nightmare come true. The only other thing to bring up with this release is that it actually faced a bit of controversy back in 2015 when Metal Sucks did a piece all about it, asking when it comes to extreme metal, why are the themes so hyper-focused on ultra-violence towards women, like there's a sexist aspect with it? Because in the opening moments of this album, there's an audio sample of a serial killer describing how he killed one of his victims, and it happens to be a woman, that he strangled her so hard that his hands ended up cramping up. While that's very disturbing and very messed up and nothing I'm trying to defend here within this video, nor do I think Metal Sucks are weak, sensitive, or SJWs for thinking and asking this, the real question I have is what were they expecting? Again, this is a collaboration between Dragged Into Sunlight and Gnaw Their Tongues. As they stated within their post, They've been a fan of Dragged Into Sunlight since they started out, so if that's the case, they should be aware of Hatred for Mankind. And as I stated earlier in this video, that album has a lot of audio samples of all different serial killers describing as, ha as to how they killed people. Then you have Gnaw Their Tongues, which has a plethora of just so much messed up themes and material within his discography. Hell, he even has a release dedicated to Ize Sakawa, which is a serial killer from Japan that cannibalized his victim. Like, this is just all insanely messed up stuff that, the, that both of these projects have just been known for doing time and time again. So if they're going to work together, you should come to expect, at least since you're a fan of them, what this release is going to come off sounding like. And yeah, it's kind of like going into an R-rated movie and watching that movie and being upset that it's not, you know, family-friendly as there's a lot of excessive vulgar language and it's very violent in nature. It kind of goes back to the notion to keep extreme music extreme. And what Envy tries to convey is just extreme metal with extreme situations to disturb you. That's the whole point of all of this. It may be fucked up in nature, and it's not really something you want to hear or ever see, and you hope it never happens, God forbid, but the overall point is to disturb you. It's extreme for the sake of being extreme. And while I understand what Metal Sucks is trying to say here, that it's messed up, that's the whole point. 
it's kind of like going into a dark room and complaining that it's just too dark when the whole point is to be a dark room. So, for me personally, I don't really think there's anything controversial to be stated here other than it's just extreme music with extreme topics. Also, one thing I want to showcase really quickly that's actually really rare that uh, is not really meant for the public, and don't ask how I got this, but I got the Dragged Into Sunlight in Mother Tongue's hype poster that they used on their tours back in 2015. And from what I heard, it's only limited to like five prints. It wouldn't be until five years later until we would hear any new material by Dragged Into Sunlight. And that would be the continuation of Terminal Aggressor, that being Terminal Aggressor Part 2. Which, musically and stylistically, it's a continuation of the first Terminal Aggressor. Just, you know, dark ambience, noise, and industrial kind of being like the backdrop for everything. Or the extreme metal portions that we're used to hearing with Dryden to Sunlight. Again, a black metal, death metal, and doom metal come in and out within this release. But what really makes this part of the Dragon to Sunlight timeline a standout is this is when they would call it quits with the label that they've been signed to, that being Prosthetic Records. I made a video two years ago basically discussing and echoing all the things that Dragon to Sunlight said about this situation, so I'm not really going to dive into it that much within this video. At this point now, both Prosthetic Records and Dragged Into Sunlight have kind of moved on past this situation and there really hasn't been any news surfacing as to what happened with taking them into court and stuff of the sort. So for the time being, I'm just kind of like in the clouds with this whole situation. Other than that, Dragged Into Sunlight really hasn't done anything other than release this one single back in 2021 last year that being Plainfield and Monarchy of the Sun, which again is just noise, dark ambience, and an audio sample that closes out the track towards the end. That might just be a teaser for an upcoming release. It might be a B-side. It might be an unreleased track that they meant to release to the public but never did until recently. I don't really know. And I know I've heard a lot of rumors that they're working on new material. They'll have a new album out any day now. And while I'll always look forward to anything of new material by this band, I'm not really holding my breath here because, again, with the whole circumstance of all the band members being so far apart from each other and how they kind of communicate with each other when it comes to their songwriting and how much of a long process that is, then you need to include their personal lives and their work lives in the matter. It's going to be quite a long time probably until we hear any new material like a full-length album by this band, but until then, I'll always keep my ear to the ground for anything new by them. And that's really it. I feel like that's all that really needs to be discussed with Dragged Into Sunlight. So yeah, that'll do it for this video. Like always, guys, I'll leave links provided to everything I talked about in the description below, and that'll do it. So like always, guys, make sure you guys drink plenty of water to stay hydrated, and have a great day.